Hi, welcome to Distinti's World, video number one. And we're going to show in very simple terms and very simple logic that man-made global warming is complete nonsense. And we're going to show some simple experiments and simple logic. In fact, I'm going to show that the government response to it may actually be lethal to the human race. So one of the experiments you'll see, uh, and this is a, well, just one example I found, this experiment I've seen run many different ways, um, is what they do is they put one container full of oxygen or air and one container full of carbon dioxide and then they expose it to a light source and they show you that the temperature of the carbon dioxide vessel is significantly higher than the temperature of the air. In this case they get 44 degrees C and 35 degrees C for air. Uh, the problem I have with this one is this guy uses Alka-Seltzer um, in this container here. I don't know why this container is brighter. It almost looks like he didn't take the label off the back side. I don't know. But why so much water? Alka-Seltzer doesn't need that much water to fizz off its carbon dioxide. And why use a heat lamp? Why not use the regular sun? I don't know. I'm going to redo this experiment. I'm going to show you that, um, that I'm going to do actual burning hydrocarbon wax as a source of CO2, which is more like what's going to happen. I'm going to use the sun instead of a, a light source, which may have a wrong spectrum compared to the sun. The heat lamp is infrared. My understanding is that the global warming is called by the ultraviolet, not the thermal. And I'm also going to use an alternative. I'm going to do the only, one thing that no one else has done before. I'm going to show you an alternative. What happens when we do the same experiment with solar cells? And another thing they never show you is, what happens when you remove the light source? How in the absence of sun do things react? So let's go off to the experiment. Okay, in order to get carbon dioxide into this container, I have another container taped to the top of it, with the bottom cut out, and then I have a candle, which has been uh, attached to a small plastic square, and a third bottle, which has its bottom cut out, but the top on. So what's going to happen, we're going to put the candle, I could have done this with a CO2 cartridge and just filled it, but that would not be fair, because um, that wouldn't really be from burning of hydrocarbons, which this is. And then we're going to put this on. Now what's going to happen is the candle is going to consume the oxygen and it's going to rise as carbon dioxide and other gas effluents into here where hopefully it cools and then the carbon dioxide is going to sink back down and because it's heavier it's hopefully going to go into the lower container. Now don't worry about the little gas coming in the side here because the, the slower this process takes, the more likely the heavier carbon dioxide will float down. The bigger problem is because the carbon dioxide is heated by the candle, it's going to rise. So I need to give it time to cool and so it floats down and, and sorts out with all the other gases to get back down in here. So when this candle goes out, we're reasonably sure that the only thing left in here is either going to be water vapor or carbon dioxide. Um, and that would be okay because a little water vapor is what you're going to get when you burn something and we're not talking about stuff that you're going to burn and that's what the whole point of global warming is, is stuff we burn. So we're going to let that finish. Still going. Alright, now that the candle is out, we're going to let this thing cool. Let the carbon dioxide float down. And then once we let it cool for about five minutes, then we're going to relight the candle and repeat this three times to make sure that, that, that what's in here is mostly carbon dioxide. Okay, so the experiment you normally see for this global warming nonsense is a bottle of air with a thermometer, a bottle of carbon dioxide, or mostly carbon dioxide, with a thermometer, and um, cooked in the sun for a little while. In this case, it's about 20 minutes. But I'm going to change this up. I'm going to show, well, if we're going to stop burning hydrocarbons, what are we going to replace it with? Well, we're going to have to replace it with little solar panels and stuff. And well, this bottle's full of solar panels, little solar panel chips, all wired to load, so they're actually doing something. So let's look at the temperature right now. Okay, and so the carbon dioxide one is at 53 degrees, and the air one is at 51 where the solar panel one is at 90 degrees or now it's 91.3 okay one thing I found about this even though in the sunlight the carbon dioxide one will uh, beat the air one by a few degrees 
The minute the sun goes away, the carbon dioxide one will sink faster than the air one does. Okay, returning from the experiment. So as you saw, the alternative solar cells is worse than the problem that we're trying to solve. So we, you know, we can't sit there and say, oh, we're going to solve global warming by using solar panels, because that's just going to, because solar panels, they get their energy by trapping sunlight, which is exactly the argument why people say we need to get rid of carbon dioxide. Okay, and in actual, the actual problem of carbon dioxide is very minimal because using 100% carbon dioxide would not be accurate, which is what the other experiments do. The atmosphere is 78% nitrogen. So you're not going to get rid of the nitrogen by burning stuff. So at worst, your CO2 is going to only be about 22%. If it's at 22%, you kill the human race. Uh, and the problem fixes it. Well, I'm being exaggerating there. But. And then what happens when the sun is, when you saw when we removed the sun, the CO2 unit co cooled faster? Why did the CO2 unit cool faster? Well, consider this, that the only way that this temp thermometer can be hotter, or show a hotter temperature, is if the CO2 in the container released the energy to it. And now that sounds weird, but listen to this. The energy has to be trapped by the CO2. But if it's trapped, it can't rightly give it to the thermometer, now can it? So it's not really trapped, it's scattered. So as easily as the CO2 can trap the sunlight and convert it into thermal energy is the rate at which it can heat the thermometer. Come on, guy. A little bad time here. And, you know, so otherwise, if the CO2 did, in fact, trap the energy such that it couldn't get to the thermometer, then there would be an endothermic reaction, which is obviously not occurring. So when the sun is removed, the CO2 container cooled faster than a regular container because without the sun, it gives its energy back quicker. It actually got colder in, in, the, in one example when it was inside. I mean, this phenomenon is well known. If you take two aluminum bars, one painted black, the other white, and expose them to the sun, the black bar will get much hotter. Everyone knows that. But a lot of people don't know is when you remove the sun, and let's say you heat them to the same temperature and you put them, put them in a dark room, okay, the black bar will cool much faster than the white bar. The black body radiation, okay, because the black can absorb solar energy, it can also radiate it too. It's reciprocal where the white cannot accept the solar radiation and therefore when it's hot it can't get rid of it either. These things are reciprocal. That means if you've got carbon dioxide on the reverse side of a planet it should be radiating heat tremendously. Now let's go into that. Let's look at this. Oh, a little bit of experimental notes. Uh, when I did the experiment indoors uh, I couldn't get it to work because the windows blocked the ultraviolet. Uh, the CO2 was always about two degrees colder than the regular air course the one with solar panels was always very hot. So let's explore this. Greenhouse heating. They say Venus is the example of greenhouse, runaway greenhouse. Well, okay, you know. Uh, but let's explore this. The Earth has a length day of one Earth day and the difference between the night side and the day side of the Earth is about 30 degrees. Yeah, it can vary more than that, but let's say 30 degrees is a good average. Okay, and the equatorial speed is 1,700 kilometers per hour. We're going to need that uh, for a calculation we're going to do later. Now, Venus, on the other hand, the length of Venus's day is 243 Earth days. Well, that means the night side of Venus is night for 120 days, 120 Earth days. And yet, they say the difference between the night and the day temperature is zero. Matter of fact, the temperature over the surface of the planet is virtually the same. The only place you get a significant radiant, uh, gradient in temperatures when you go up in altitude. Okay, and the equatorial speed is 6.5 kilometers per hour. So now the problem is, is if this is caused by global warming on the sun side, and you got 120 days of darkness on the back side, how does the heat get from the back side to the dark side, considering that this carbon dioxide on the back side of the planet should be radiating that energy back out into space real fast? Well, I would think then there would be tremendous winds carrying that wind, that, air, that thermal energy back to the back, right? Well, they say that, the, and here's how they cryptically write this. The Venusian winds move it up to 60 times the speed of the planet's rotation. Well, Earth's fastest winds are only 10 to 20 percent of rotation. Well, it sounds like they've got tremendous winds on Venus, but if you actually look at the rotation speed of Venus, it's only 6.5 kilometers an hour, which 60 times 6.5 kilometers an hour is 390 uh, miles, uh, kilometers per second. That's not miles per hour. That's kilometers per hour, not miles per hour. And, okay, so the fastest Earth speeds are 20% of rotation, which would be 340 kilometers per hour. 
So there's no significant increase in winds on Venus. If the winds on Venus are proportional. If it's closer to the sun, it's proportional to the same winds we get on the Earth. So there's no way. And then for a planet that's night lasts 120 days, I would think that the only way that day and night temps are the same is because of extreme winds. But the only way you can have extreme winds is if you have an extreme temperature gradient. So there's no explanation why the temperature over the surface of Venus is constant, whether you're at night or day at the pole, whatever. Oh, and here's the other one I love. According to Wiki, above the dense CO2 layer are thick clouds consisting mainly of sulfur dioxide and sulfuric acid droplets. These clouds reflect and scatter 90% of the sunlight back into space. So let me get this straight. We have a planet with runaway greenhouse, but most of the sunlight never reaches the CO2. Now some people might say, well, it's the sulfur dioxide and sulfuric acid that traps the sunlight. But no, they say 90% is being reflected. Okay, and this atmosphere is so dense and thick that if any part of the atmosphere is going to be heated, it's going to be the upper atmosphere. But they say the highest temperatures are near the surface. This is all nonsense. The only solution that makes sense is that Venus's atmosphere is like a thick insulation layer, like a big layer of pink insulation. And the volcanic heat from the core um, is held back close to the surface from venting into space because of the thick insulation layer of the planet. That's the only way that you could have a uniform temperature over the surface, even on the sun side and the night side. And this means that the sun has an insignificant effect, only enough to create Earth-like winds, which is basically all we're getting. But there's interesting things about the Earth. Okay, from Wiki, they say the Earth's increased surface temperature will accelerate the inorganic CO2 cycle, reducing its concentration to levels lethally low for plants. Okay, but they tie this to the sun cycle as the sun uh, increases in temperature over the next millions of years. Oh, okay, they're saying here the sun's increasing. Well, anyway. So, all right, fine. So, basically what they're saying is that increased temperature could cause plants to suck up all the carbon dioxide to the point they suffocate themselves. Okay. But then they say the water later on, the water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and ozone are the primary greenhouse gases in the Earth atmosphere. Without this heat retention effect, the average surface temperature would be 18 degree, minus 18 degrees C in contrast to the current plus 15 degrees C, and life would likely not exist. So, okay, if the plants suck up the carbon dioxide, it would drop the temperature reducing the heat. So it sounds like a self-correcting problem. I mean, if the temperature is rising and the plants suck up the carbon dioxide, the temperature is going to go back down. And then the plant's ability to suck up the is going to be reduced. It's a self-fixing problem. Say it again. Increase in temperature increases plants' ability to pull CO2 out of the air. The reduced CO2 will drop temperature and slow the process. Sounds like a self-regulating system to me. But let's do some back-of-the-napkin mathematics here. Going to the uh, EIA government cool tools, fact, fact, blah, blah, blah. They say that uh, for the whole Earth, all the countries, from all the burning of fossil fuels, the amount of metric tons of CO2 released in the air is 32579 million metric tons. And this is just in 2011 by itself. Okay, that works out to this many kilograms times 5.09 liters per kilogram for CO2. And that's how many liters of CO2. And I got this conversion from this guy over here. So it's 1.7 times 10 to the 16 liters. Oh, that sounds like a lot. But let's find the volume of the Earth's atmosphere in liters. I'm not going to go through all this. You can, guys can do this on your own. We come out that the density of the Earth, just based on nitrogen and oxygen, because the other ones are trace, that the atmospheric density is 1.307 grams per liter. And they say from Wikipedia that the, that the kilograms of the atmosphere are 5 times 10 to the 18th. So I multiply that by 1,000 to get it into grams, and we divide by 1.037, and we come out with the volume of the Earth atmosphere is 3.83 times 10 to the 21 liters at standard temperature and pressure, of course. So, if we were to divide what we burn in one year by the volume of the atmosphere, that would be a CO2 increase of 4.3 parts per million. Very small, tiny increase. The existing CO2 content is 400 parts, I'm rounding up because I don't want to say 397, 400 parts per million by volume. That's parts per million. 
Okay? And so we would have to burn fuel for 100 years just to double the current CO2 concentration, holding everything else stable. All right, but let's say that we go back to that, the video I showed at the beginning. And let's assume, and not my video, the video, the, 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 the guy's video, the other guy. And let's assume that 100% concentration of CO2 does give a 9 degrees C temperature rises in the video. Well, that's 0 0.09 degrees C per percent. So what happens to the temperature of, of the Earth, a temperature of a vessel, when CO2 goes from 400 parts per million, which is virtually nothing, to 800 parts per million, which is still virtually nothing? Well, we're going, that goes from 0.04% to 0.08%, which is a change of 0.04%. And 0.4% times 0 0.09 is a change of 0 0.036 degrees C. And I'm assuming that these numbers are so small, everything's still linear at this time which is an insignificant change in temperature. And so, well, why are all these people going nuts over the concentration levels and da 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 da, da? Okay, well, let's, it goes back to uh, this. This is a chart from a Scientific American, uh, February of 2007. When I got this in the mail, I took one look at this chart over here, and I said global warming is nuts. And just from this chart, I can tell global warming is nonsense. Okay, why? Well, there's three reasons. First of all, they say, okay, this is the methane level, and they say in the article that plants are the primary producer of methane. Okay, CO2, they don't say where the CO2 comes from. And this is the global temperature. And this goes back 650,000 years. Over here, this little point here is where man comes on the stage here. Or somewhere in that area. Okay, so what happens, you see the temperature goes up, and the CO2 goes up, and the methane goes, oh, gee, you know, there's a correlation. Uh. But the problem I have is going back before man, well, if, if the CO2 is causing the temperature increase, then what caused this CO2 to rise right here? Did, I mean, did the woolly mammoths go out and start burning stuff? Did they start going out to doing deep, she deep ocean drilling wells and pulling up all kinds of hydrocarbons and start bumping up the carbon dioxide because they were tired of being in the ice age? I mean, where is it? They don't explain where this carbon dioxide comes from. That's one problem I have. And the other problem I have, the biggest problem of all, is over here where man comes on the line, you see the carbon dioxide go off the chart. It goes up to, because right now they say it's at 400, which would be right about there. So when mankind's come on the stage, we've bumped this carbon dioxide from about, oh, I'd say about 275 to 400, not quite a doubling, a little less than, uh, only by 33%. So in the, since we've been burning fossil fuels on this planet, we've only increased the carbon dioxide concentration by 33%. Okay, because this isn't zero over here, that starts at 200, so don't let the graph fool you. Okay, we've only increased it about 33%. But still, it's higher. The key thing here, it's higher than it's ever been in the history of the world of what we have record for. And if carbon dioxide is the cause of global warming, then we should expect the temperature to be higher than it's ever been in the past. No, nope, temperature's right here. It's not higher. That's because like the calculation I did before, the quantity of carbon dioxide is almost insignificant to global temperature. And you say, well, how does this go up and down? What's the cause? Well, let me first show you something that they teach engineers that I don't think they teach scientists. All right, what they teach engineers that they don't seem to teach uh, scientists because um, this, this would be a no-brainer. This is the reason why I looked at the chart and said oh, immediately that the global warming theory is wrong. Let's say, talk about cause and effect. Let's say I say that eating a cheeseburger makes you fat. Well, eating the cheeseburger is the cause and getting fat is the effect. And it only takes, a, let's say the blue line is the rate at which you can eat the cheeseburger, and that might only be about five minutes. Okay, but as you're eating the cheeseburger, you're gaining the weight of the mass that you're taking into your mouth, and so the cause and effect on the rising edge are going to be almost nearly identical, but the cause should lead the effect nonetheless. After you're done eating the cheeseburger, well, your fat's not going to, your fat cells are going to hold on to that wait for a long, 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 long time. And as you get older, that time gets longer and longer. And so the cause will lead the effect on the rising edge, and the cause will lead the effect on the falling edge. And if there's a thing called memory, memory is a term that engineers use for something that will retain, like weight is a retains 
the cause, the, the energy from the cause. In this case, in this example, the cheeseburger, the fat cells are retaining the, the, the calories from the cheeseburger. Okay, so in a typical system like that, you should see your cause should be a narrow and your effect should be wider. Okay, so if we go back and look at this chart again, we see that, gee, this is fatter than this. This is fatter than this. This is the cause, that's the effect. The temperature causes the carbon dioxide levels to rise. Now up here, this is the methane. They say plants generate the methane. And that's fine, uh, because um, what's happening here, this is uh, what I'm going to say is animal respiration. Respiration. It will, it will explain why this is slower than this and this more matches this. But ultimately this is the cause to this. And here's another example here. Here you have this spike in global temperature, but the animals start but then stop before they finally catch up. But again, as this stuff drops off, there's a slow lagging drop off in animal and in, in respiration gas, which says these are animals. They're, they're breath of animals or something like that. Okay, and therefore it's clear that the cause is the temperature and the effect is the, resp is the respiration gases. And you're like, well, how come we have this effect like this? Well, let me explain it to you this way. Suppose we have this pl our planet here, and the planet is in an ice age with just a little tiny bit of the area. This green area is the area where you know, plants and animals can exchange their respiration gases. Well, what happens is, eventually, we get warming goes on for whatever reason. Probably the sun output increases. Who knows? That increases the area in which plants and animals can migrate or uh, uh, migrate into. Granted, the animals migrate, but the plants send their seeds and eventually spread. Okay, um, and so there's going to be a lag for animals migrating into the new warmer areas. It's fine. Now, like in this example here, okay, where the there's an increase in temperature, but there was a the spike got uh, deadened. That could be that there was some plague or something that killed the animals, and eventually they caught up. Okay, because there's other effect, things affecting animals other than you know global temperature going on here. Because logically, though, you know there's no way you can argue that well this bump in carbon dioxide caused this temperature bump, but this little bump in carbon dioxide caused a much bigger. Yeah, come on, you know. All right, then what happened later is after things peaked out, the global temperature started falling again and went from this to this. So now what happens is is your plants and animals are sorry, your animals are going to migrate into this smaller area and they're going to maybe adapt a little bit, a little bit of adaptation. And therefore, as the temperature decreases, there's going to be a slower decrease in the animal life as they migrate and or adapt. Now the problem, the reason why the plant gases went down at the same rate is because the plants can't migrate into here. So as the temperature falls and the ice uh, expands, the plants are not, can't migrate, and so they're just going to get killed off. And that's why the plant curves look almost identical to the temperature curves. And that's basically what I was saying there. But let's suppose, let's go one step further, and let's suppose that you know people get their way, that these global warming enthusiasts get their way and make us stop using fossil fuels altogether. Okay. That means that the carbon in the biosphere is the carbon in the biosphere. The carbon is in our bodies, it's in the plants, it's in the animals, and all vegetation, including algae and sea life. So if the human population is going to expand, well, this increase in carbon over here has to come from carbon somewhere else. And without plants and animals, we can't sustain ourselves, and then we start fighting over each other for the few remaining animals. We like to do things like that, like war over things, like oil and stuff like that. So in order to keep the human population healthy, we got to give carbon back. So we need to dig, drill, 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 baby. Dig, dig, dig. Burn all this crap. Send the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because it'll increase. We can double and triple the levels. It isn't going to hurt us. It's only going to significantly increase global temperature so that the algae can feed and the algae can feed the fish and the plants can take the carbon dioxide out to feed the, the, uh, the land animals and we can eat them and everybody's happy. So free the carbon. It's a win-win scenario. 
All right, beware though of scam scientists because we have over 650,000 years of temperature gas data. Okay, it's not going to be hard to find a section in the data because of other random events going on where one curve matches another curve almost exactly. Okay, uh, but this is only going to happen in small, small sections. Okay, and the reason why that there are other factors contributing gases to the environment which may obscure the contribution from life and that could be volcanoes, forest fires, etc, etc. Alright, so this is what a scam will do. A scammer is only going to show you the part of the data that fit their, their uh, theory. Just like the carbon dioxide experiment at the beginning, they don't show you what happens when you take the light away and they don't show you the alternatives. They only show you the part that fits their theory. And you say, well, well, why would scientists do that? Well, how, I mean, well, Remember, how can government-funded scientists ensure that politicians will keep funding them? Well, you don't want to go around saying that the world is fine. And politicians and the people, like, well, why am I paying your tax? I mean, taxes or money is, you know, hard to come by. Why am I going to fund you? And that's why we have these endless end-of-the-world scenarios coming out of government-funded research. Like back in the 70s when I was a kid, ooh, we're going into the next ice age. And then the 80s, we had the hole in the ozone layer, which magically went away. And in the 90s, we had asteroids, and we spent a lot of money to go search for asteroids, but we're finding out recently that asteroids are passing right by us, and we didn't even know it until after the asteroid passed. So what are we spending all this money for? And then we have global warming in the 2000s, which I show you that very simply, with simple logic and experiments, that global warming is complete nonsense. The Earth is getting warmer because of an increased output in the sun. Um, and the Higgs boson was the most recent nonsense. Uh, if you remember back in November of 2012, they, the scientists release, oh, we found this crazy thing that we don't understand, and that's how the news media came out. And they were, then they realized they made a mistake, like, oh, geez, you know, we're the scientists that define what nuclear physics does, and how can we be telling the world that we have no clue what's going on in our Large Hadron Exciter, and we're the people that make the science that makes nuclear reactors possible? And this is right after Fukushima. And then so they just say, re released in December of 2012, and said, yeah, that's it. We found the Higgs boson. Yeah, that's it. It was the Higgs boson. Then people are like, okay, fine. What are we funding you for? Big deal. Then they came out and re-released in February 13th. Said, yeah, well, we figured out from the Higgs boson that there's going to come a time in the future when the whole universe is just going to collapse into nothing, or something to that effect. So there they added the end of the world scenario so they can get their funding. And that's what always happens. Okay, politicians make the most money. You can read that on your own. Just follow the money. That's all I ask. Glaciers. Okay, scientists have always been moaning the loss of glaciers. Always is the key word. Okay, this is a book from 1897, Forms of Water by Tyndale. Okay, and who is Tyndale? Tyndale is professor of natural philosophy at the Royal Institution. Okay, and what he says in his foreword, the first sentence in his foreword, I have it here. It's after an absence of 12 years, I visited the Mer de Glace last June. It exhibited in a striking degree that excess of consumption over supply, which, if continued, will eventually reduce the Swiss glaciers to the mere specter of their former selves. Okay? Come on, people. Who wants to pay money for scientists to go out there and watch glaciers um, ice melt? I mean, my God, if, if you know, they just go out there to get, they bemoan the loss of how terrible it is to society. So why? So they can get funding to go out there, drink beer so they can watch ice melt. Come on. Enough of this voodoo physics. Thank you.